Hey everyone, this is Pete Brushy Racing here. Today we are going to find out what kind of power an engine makes after 100,000 miles and over 150 days on a closed course. On average, that's once every 10 days that I am feeding on this car at an autocross or a track day. Our test subject is my 2015 Ford Mustang EcoBoost. I know what you're thinking. I could have had a V8! Well, I bought this car four years ago, straight out of college. I wanted to get the most car that I could afford, that I could still have money left in the bank to become the best driver that I could possibly be. In addition to 90,000 miles daily driven, I have campaigned in this car in 10 different states, winning two local championships, securing two fastest time of days, and having the time of my life getting involved with the grassroots motorsports community. I really recommend that you go find local motorsports in your area. You can do so on motorsportreg.com. I run the car in SCCA D Street, which is a class that heavily restricts the modifications. The lack of modifications has kept my car comfortable and reliable for daily driving, as well as for traveling up to 18 hours away on over 2,000 mile round trips for competitions. But just because it's a street class car doesn't mean we haven't been a threat. We've beat cars with a lot more money and horsepower. One of the most fun parts about my journey is proving that horsepower isn't everything and that the most important part of the car is the nut holding the steering wheel. I'll never get tired of people walking over to my car, looking under my hood and saying, man, I can't believe that's just a four cylinder. So what have I done to avoid the dreaded eco boom? I've done so much beating on this car, but I don't abuse it. I think the vast majority of eco booms are caused by their owners. The Mustang is a lot of people's first sports car and a lot of people's first turbo car. And not everyone is aware of the extra precautions and maintenance that you should take with one of these high performance vehicles. I've been early on all of my maintenance and use top quality consumables. We always make sure to warm up the engine before we beat on it. We always allow it to cool off and especially on turbocharged engines, we don't let the engine lug down below 2000 RPM and build boost we avoid low speed pre-ignition. Building extra pressure in an engine at the wrong time is a great way to blow a head gasket or put a window in the side of your block. I brought the car over to Power Curve Motorsports, not just because it's close to me, but because the owner Rob is a prominent member of the local car community. He's been in business over 10 years, and not only is he good to the local car community, but he opens his shop up to host lots of events throughout the year that give back to local charities. It's always great when we can use our cars and resources to help other people. If you're in the Charlotte area and you've got a Ford V8 that you're looking to tune, Rob is your guy. The best run made was 278 wheel horsepower and 331 pound-feet of torque. When you consider all the beating on this car I've done, this is an incredible number, especially considering these cars are known to make anywhere from 240 to 260 horsepower on a dyno. When we look at the dyno curve, we see the car makes torque pretty quickly. Long turbo lag is a thing of the past with Ford's twin scroll design. You'll notice on the second run in red that we did have quite a bit of fall off after 6,000 RPMs. This is probably due to heat soak. We had a fan blowing on the intercooler on the dyno, but the engine was probably pulling timing earlier because of warmer air temps. The power ramps up and gets into its peak about 5,000 RPM. After that, you'll notice a couple of little dips in there. Well, I think those dips could be linked to some small issues that I've been having. On cold startups, the car tends to make these slight puffing sounds from the exhaust. <coughs> when I pull up to a traffic light, sometimes the car won't idle. It'll drop to 500 RPMs or so, and it takes a couple love taps from the gas pedal to get it to idle. 
And sometimes when I give it a good pull, when I lift to shift, the car backfires on me. Now, it didn't do any of these things the day that I bought it, so what could be the cause? With the engine making as much power as it is, I'm pretty sure the source of my drivability quirks are carbon deposits. These carbon deposits are a side effect of direct injection. As engineers continue to chase fuel economy, direct injection has shown to improve losses. Traditional fuel injection systems would spray fuel outside of the cylinder, and that had the effect of cleaning the valve. Now that this engine design only sprays fuel inside of the cylinder, the valves aren't getting clean and carbon deposits are prone to forming. These carbon deposits disrupt the flow of air on the valve. We see companies are starting to retrofit their current engine designs with a secondary port injection on the outside. But what are guys like me supposed to do about carbon buildup? Well, I've invested in a walnut blaster and I'm going to take off the intake, clean the valves, and run another dyno test to see if we can clear out those dips and make more power. At 110,000 miles with no catch can, I'm sure there is some kind of buildup on the back of my valves. To what extent? I got you to know. With the engine making as much power as it is, it really goes to show that you can put these modern engines through a lot. And as long as you take care of the car, it'll take care of you. It's really a testament to Ford Motor Company building a great EcoBoost engine. I'm really looking forward to another 100,000 miles and beyond. In the next video, we'll show what happens when you clean off those carbon deposits. I'm pretty convinced that with a good cleaning, we can make more power. What do we need? More power! Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you know when I put out part two.